So, we're here with the Bloody Sunday March, where uh, the crowd gathered, and the geography and uh, the landscape around here has changed a lot, but in many ways it's still the same, because we have a park here, but there would have been an old-fashioned park with an old-fashioned roundabout. So we've the roundabout here, things turning in circles. And uh, it would have been a day, 30th of January 1972, would have been just very much like it is here today, dry, which also helps for getting a crowd out for uh, uh, a demonstration, a, a march, and uh, a jovial atmosphere, a carnival atmosphere, and uh, lots and lots of young people all dressed up, and uh, it was a Sunday, so a lot of people with their shirts and ties on, and had their Sunday dinner, and out and out they protest against internment go oh, and make a statement that it was wrong to be taking people without charge, without any trial, denying them their basic civil rights and, and, and uh, putting you into an internment camp, like a, a prisoner of war camp. Uh, people says caged in like an animal, etc, etc, saying it was wrong. Civil Rights Association organised the merch gallery in here. Uh, the noise and the hum of the crowd and bits of boats are singing and, and buses pulling up, cars pulling up. People who unfurling their banners and already they head off in the procession up here down the town. And as uh, Emma McCann recently says it, you know, the sound of the stomping feet the merchant changed things politically in that, more so than gunfire. And uh, as they went merged up here and set off on the journey, clapping hands and singing, we shall overcome, you know. Uh, and as it would go up here and start descending down Southway, that, but when they set off here that day, I mean, nobody was expecting to happen what happened. I mean, if only they'd known. I left my grandchild at school this morning, and she's seven, going on eight. And I just thought back at 50 years ago on the 30th of January 1972, I was seven going on it. So it's 50 years on, a different generation. And in a few weeks' time, uh, it's going to be the 50th anniversary of uh, one of the most infamous atrocities, massacres took place in the streets here, right here where we're standing. Here's where, it all, where, where the shooting began. Because the crowd and the merch, the anti internment merch, was coming down from Craigan. And as it passed through the Brandyville on the bog side, it was gathering momentum. And there was a louder stamp of feet and more people and singing we shall overcome and they'd already encountered the British Army up here at the cathedral but it was ordinary British troops from the local, the regiment was stationed locally and they uh, encountered British troops up here at the women's bath too but the stewards managed to direct them down here. So the first shots fired that day would have been over around here, there was Stevenson's Bakery and on the roof of the bakery was paratroopers and when they seen the paratroopers they started stoning them and the paratroopers opened fire with live rounds and they shot two people. I think it was uh, Bubbles Donaghy and John Johnson. So, I think then it dawned on people that this was serious. Uh, the, 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 there, was a, there was a bad situation developing. Over towards here, the church, where the British, where the paratroopers, one of the companies of paratroopers were there with and they launched their operation. There was more of them down here, so the crowd then proceeded on down and the uh, stewards and the lorry, which was leading the way, proceeded over Roswell Street. They were Lord Brockaway and uh, Fenway were going to give the, the speeches. But as usual, uh, the young uh, raiders, they made their way down the barricade and that's where all hell had let loose them with the usual, throwing the stones, CS gas getting fired, rubber bullets. I mean, it's famous, you can see the guys coming out with a, with a the big sheets of tin and there's dye came and gets spread out. And uh, so we go down to the barricade where it was there, uh, we'll talk more about it. So, over towards here, with the, the post office would have been way open ground here. CS gas flying, rioting, uh, more rioting down here. And remember, 
the vast majority of the marchers have made their way across there to the Free Dairy Corner. So, the young uh, rioters and that's approaching here. That's a crack one. And uh, me and Barry are trying to prevent them, uh, the march. Uh, on the original day of Bloody Sunday would have been just across here. So there's famous footage of the raiders coming out of here. And they had big sheets of tin. And they were attacking it and they brought up a, a purple dye water cannon and there was rubber bullets flying and spittles flying. It was very vicious like, but it was nothing out of the ordinary compared to what was happening on a weekly daily basis then. So here was the barrier and then when the decision was made then they launched the parazon. You can see the famous uh, footage of the general in charge of the, the whole British Army saying go on the paras and stamp on the ground and sort of like go on and get them. And they come on here and they come on here on foot and they start heading up there and everybody starts scattering. But the boys are coming on from up here but they're coming on in uh, uh, vehicles and now it's just like a pincer movement. It's like a military pincer movement and uh, then when it all happened. Really. So they had intended to get peacefully up there and uh, Frank Lagan, the RUC inspector, had uh, recommended that they be allowed to go through to the guilt hall, take as many photographs as you can, identify people and prosecute later. But it wasn't to be that day, the military seemed to be in total control. So, if you have any military knowledge, or any knowledge of gunfire and one thing or another, this here is a wee small side street, and the famous footage is of the Paris here. Now what you have to understand is over here was the Roswell Flats, which they thought, or you would probably think would be a strategic area for snipers or something, whatever, that. So they're all here, you see the famous footage of the Paris, standing here, and then you see the body. Uh, my own cousin Jackie Dudley getting carried over here uh, and they carry them up there. Uh, very brave people went out to uh, under fire. A lot of heroics, heroics that day. All the heroics that I would say was from the civilians. And uh, started shooting, shooting here and at the same time the other paratroopers were moving on up here on this open ground but they were moving on, on uh, uh, like an anti-tank platoon, you know, dis disembarking from uh, armoured personnel carriers and things like that. But there was actually hand to hand fighting with paratroopers here and batons getting, and then they started opening fire. And uh, within a short space of time, there was 13 people dead, 28 injured, whatever. It was a killing zone all around here, mostly on up here. Father, how many dead have you seen in the bog side? Appearing to be dead. There are the three in that Saracen car. There are two men lying at the end of this block of flats. There's another man at least very close to being dead. There's one, there are two others up there. I'm told that there, there are some more in these flats here that I haven't seen yet. I would say there are probably about four dead at this moment. Uh, I don't know what those are doing, whether they're alive or dead. But they seem to be very dead and they're thrown in as if they were dead meat.
So when the paratroopers they entered in their vehicles and started disembarking off them and jumping out, they started going on the, the way they were trained. It was as if they were going on the action against Russian special forces or something, or else they were going to encounter the Green Berets. It was free dairy over there. So they took up positions here at these walls and started firing up the barricades. And uh, they fired a rubber bullet up here at this window. And that uh, window was the flat of uh, Sergeant uh, Patrick Smith. My sister-in-law's father, one of the men that was at Dunkirk. And uh, so they were firing here up in, uh, like they killed John Kelly and Michael McDade and that. Uh, up here, Jackie Dolly was killed in the courtyard, Patrick Dolly and Barney McGuigan up here. But what happened is, is then a, a, a platoon of them, or a, a section or a squad of them, moved down here to Glenfada Park. Nothing much has changed here on Glenfada Park, apart from the new museum. It's much the same as it was then. So this is really, this was a serious killing zone here. This, this is where a lot happened. My grandfather, Ed Houston, lived in that flat there. And uh, he was an other World War II veteran. And he actually heard the gunshots that killed his, his grandson. Uh, uh, Jackie Dolly and Jackie Dolly's father was another World War II veteran uh, but the Paris came on here, some of them shooting from the hip shooting from the hip, cowboy style, bang bang knights of multi, everybody running around this was, uh, you can only imagine the terror on the people and uh, Jim Ray was killed up here and they went over and finished them off and all shot the back a uh, good friend of mine, Jonah, Jonah Kane was along with his brother-in-law, McKinney and he stuck his arms up over here and the bullet actually went through there and out there and uh, nobody was spared. It seems they were all having a good wee laugh and giggle about it and all. And Peter Taylor, when he came over for the Sunday Times after it, hey, after it, interviewed a Welshman that had served 22 years in the British Army and witnessed it all up here from his back windows and his front windows and was able to tell him, even though he was 22 years in the British Army, that what I witnessed that day was a massacre. So we come over here, we can actually see some of the bullet strikes that are still here. So, we've still got some original bullet strikes. John O'Kane's telling you how many his brother and all were here. We're shot, and uh, a lot of the injured then were taken over. This would have been opened up, took them through to Raymond Rogan's house. Now we have the museum on here recording it all. We were youngsters, we used to come down here and used to, it was like gory revisiting the battle scene, sticking your fingers on these holes and all, you know, relating stories about what had happened. So, and here's a scene of slaughter, and they were shooting rings around them, shooting from the hip, gas masks on, as if it was a, a war killing zone. And then over here's the Roswell Flats. So, it's well hard to describe the geography of it, but the Roswell Flats would be here, where the row of houses is there. And a lot of people were trying to get under the flats for safety. So the paratroopers were here. And if you remember, the barricades are here and there. And that's free area over there where they, they didn't enter. It was like a, an IRA control zone, so they were fearful to enter there, whatever. And they stood here then and they shot Barney uh, Patrick Doherty over here, crawling. And they shot Barney McGuigan through the head. He came out with a white hiker, Chief May Moore. Always says he was one of the most civil human beings you'll ever uh, meet in your life. And they shot uh, Hugh Gilmore as he was trying to get on the, uh, the Symphony of the Roswell Flats. John Kelly. One of the great acts of heroism that day was from uh, Knights of Malta Gear. Who thinks she ever gets the credit? She deserves running here to they try and help people. 
And then you had the man from Craigan crawled out on their fire to try and help Patrick Doherty. Barney McGuigan came out wear, waving the white handkerchief. They didn't know what they were dealing with. And these boys were standing here, they were just firing. Some had fired 20 shots or something up at a window up here uh, on the flats. And uh, so as you can see, most of the people were already over here. They were lying on under the they were lying on under the platform that was supposed to have the have the speakers that day. And uh, well, anyway, it all ended, ended as quick as what it, 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 it began. And it was a really sad sight of human bodies here. Ordinary civilians, people getting thrown in like lumps of meat under the back of armoured cars, pigs with uh, uh, highly trained professional paratroopers. And uh, another great act of heroism here was Mr. Nash going out under fire because they, uh, they try and help his son. So we've now got the monument over here. Bridget Bond had the great honour of unveiling it. And uh, 1974 was unveiled. So that was this was the Roswell Flats in here. So as you can see from the geography the area, there was always accusations that the British Army and the walls were firing down that day. So you can see the, the monuments got the Northern Ireland Civil Rights Association. It was unveiled by uh, Bridget Bond, a great uh, woman of the people. Uh, don't think she ever gets the credit she deserves anyway, but you can see, look, 17, 17, 17 years old, 17 years old, 17 years old, 17 years old. We're just boys, and uh, we have an interesting story. I like to tell members of the Protestant Unionist Loyalist community when they come down here, that John Young here, the last name of those who died on the day, because John Johnson died afterwards. But John Young, the last name on that. Have you go up to the War Memorial on the Diamond? The last name on that is his grandfather, Tommy Young, which is a uh, thing. So, it's unbelievable the many visitors still come here, and 50 years after, it still brings people to tears to think about it. I wasn't a young boy then, but I'll tell you, there's only one thing I can remember about then, and, and that was the silence. There was this wild silence for days, you know. It's unbelievable, you can't... You can't put it on the words, it's just some kind of, I think it's a stunned silence or something. These houses up here where the cars are parked and these little beautiful trees are now, that would be houses, uh, Rogan's house and that were uh, a lot of injured and that were taken in and they were tended to be doctors who uh, immediately ascertained that the wounds were so severe that first aid was no good, they had to be got to hospital for surgery and they zoomed off in their cars to try and get to Alton McGilvin. Of course, the ambulances start, had started arriving then, and people were trying to comprehend what happened. I was actually up in my own house because uh, my mother left me behind. And a man called Patsy Heffern called at the door to say that you heard Jackie had been injured or killed because he was a boxer and Patsy was in charge of the boxers. I just remember the darkness and the silence, and, the, and you just knew something was happening because there was a neighbour who'd never set foot in our house. And I'd actually broke his window one time with my ball. And I was frightened because he actually came in to talk to my father. And I thought, there's something really seriously wrong when this man is in our house standing and talking. Nope. So here's Free Dairy Corner. This is where the, they actually assembled in. Once they realised that they weren't getting in the, uh, the Guildhall Square. But not how much happened here other than people diving for cover and scattering and uh, talking to all their relatives and friends that were actually there on the day. They were glad that they'd followed the lorry and had come over here because they'd got out of the way. My uh, mother-in-law, Margaret Patterson, and her husband, Alan, they'd just given, they had just had a baby. And she was a New Year's baby in 1972. And they were shot at over there. They give they give evidence to the 
to give evidence to the Bloody Sunday inquiry. Uh, there, but for the grace of God, it could have been anybody. I think that's the whole thing about Bloody Sunday. It could have been anybody. So, we've talked about the people, you know, they were human beings. Like a, little, a lot of people lost their lives in the conflict. Uh, there's a man takes tours around here, Bogside Tours, excellent tour it is. He lost his father that day and he'll tell you that the provisional IRA were very molten, had 30 members or something like that before Bloody Sunday. And after Bloody Sunday, it went up under the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. So, if anybody's here is not actually from the city or from, you can see we still have heavily armour plated police landovers. So, I mean, we've talked a lot about what happened that day and how it happened and who did it and the inquiries and the hurt and the anguish and the pain. These are the people here. I mean, they've been come ingrained into the, the psyche of the vast majority of nationalists, people and Catholic people in Derry and John Michael Kelly was a neighbor of ours, Jim Ray. The Nashes lived behind us. Willie McKinney worked in the journal office. Cousin Jackie Dolly, talented boxer. I think he was with the Pippers coming back to join the Merchant Navy like his father. Uh, Barney McGuigan, if Moore always says a big civil human being. John Young. I mean, uh, they're all forever ingrained in the minds of people. The paratroopers really didn't engage any further than in Glenfada Park. Remember, we were there, it was in the killing zone on there. So they didn't come out here, as far as I know anyway. So when they got the wounded and the dead, they got them on here, and they got them on the houses here. And they were able to uh, try and get first aid done. A lot of people done a lot of brave things. It's all blocked off here now, it's all gated off because of anti-social behaviour, but it was all open then. And you could have just came through there, that would have been a gap on the Glenfana Park, so the paras would have been in there. If their men were killed in there, they had been lucky enough to get in out here and that there. I mean, it's all what ifs, isn't it? But that would have been open there, uh, and that would be where uh, Mr. McKinney put his arms up in that and we're jumping all, all in there. So you can only imagine what the sounds were like, and the smells of cordite and gunfire and CS gas and that. I mean. You can only imagine it, you can't get that in a, a film, but uh, so that's the back of Glenfara Park here. So the people on here were, my granddad was telling me, they were all lying on the ground. Some of them were brave enough to peek outside, out, out their windows. And I think I came out in an inquiry that uh, a brave woman got up there hanging, seen the paras coming through, and one of the guys, she motioned them, they let on and play dead. You know, they had a move, they might have finished them off. So, a lot of people find it remarkable that it happened in such a small space. You know, uh, the, the death zone, the killing zone was all within, within sight and sound of one another. Uh, just on there, and over towards the flats. 
hard to imagine, 50 years have passed. So, whenever it was all over, they'd done their killing, they'd thrown bodies on the backs of things, they got their orders in, and they came back out, and away they went, and they arrested lots of people. And uh, there's some famous footage of them coming down here, Kells Walk. Uh, a woman in amongst them, I think it's Mrs. O'Brien, and you can see Barry Liddy, he was a K Korean veteran and all, with her hands in her head, Father Bradley, all getting merged over here to be processed and arrested, and uh, taken down to the camp. And as far as we can get from the, the Savile Inquiry, that there was actually a lot of hostility amongst the resident soldiers, British or troops that were stationed here, because they thought the Paras were just going to walk off and they were going to be left holding the baby and they were going to get the, the, the killings, which actually proves very uh, prophetic because that's actually what did happen. It shows them coming down Kale's Walk there, all getting merged down under and the Paras aren't taking no prisoners, they're biting people on the sides, hitting them with their batons and that and uh, clubbing them over the head and getting forced frog merged over here and women, anybody lined up against the wire and on the trucks and all and down and away they went. And I think there was a famous panorama program in afterwards where they were interviewed up at Palace Barracks and they were really lit that they'd done a great job down here. And it's mad they think that later on that year in September they went up and they, they were let loose on the Shankill Road and the UDA wanted rid of them, campaigned uh, to get rid of the Paras off the Shankill Road. Uh, they actually shot a man that but a drink on him one night, standing on the road, and somebody else they shot an hour man dead. And Unionist friends tell me to this day you'll never see a banner on the Shankill Road supporting Soldier F for the Paris, because they got a full it. And on the UDA report for that September on the Shankill Road, after they killed and injured the people up on the Shankill Road, uh, they took eyewitness statements, and it seems that after they killed the men on the Shankill Road during the day, they went round me a tan house speaker later on that night in their jeeps, saying that we'd, what we'd done to your men that day, we're going to do to your women tonight. The drama, the, 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 the heartache, the pain all went down to who was dead. There were that many rumours running about, and phones were few and far between. I think there was only about six phones in the whole of the Craig and Estate. I know when my mother and Emmons were running around trying to find out about the casualties and find out if young Jackie was on the actually had to go to the watchman's site hut who had a telephone uh, in the St Mary's Community Centre and then the families, if you've seen the films and that, when they reached the hospital and the, the hospital wasn't designed to cope with casualties and such a, like, it was like something from a war scene and uh, then the word started getting through back to the community, who was dead, the rumours and, and that and uh, I think a lot of people over the years I've always they always mention that silence. There's the stunned silence that there was that shock. So here's St Mary's bloody Sunday, fifty years of Denny's have seen the family. I've seen the family I've seen the film. It was actually filmed down here and uh, they used Mickey Bradley from the undertones, the pop groups house here. And you can see here, but this is the original place. You've seen people standing all along the walls, thousands, all up there for the, for the coffins all arriving for the mass celebrated by the bishop on here. Uh, I can't remember being at the funerals, but I remember us being up the night before to see the coffins in the chapel. And uh, the one thing I do remember is the smell of the candles and the silence. And, uh, yeah, Young boys are in our age and girls are always, when we've talked over the years, I've also said as well, there was a lot of overzealous civil rights stewards that were telling us they'd get lost and all because we were young people. Instead of saying this, you know, come in and, you know, and welcoming us. We always remember that. Because, I mean, we actually went up to the wake house with my cousin and the boy outside, I had to go and see my mommy. <laughs> as you do when you're, you're, you're that age. And uh, I'm telling me to get lost and all that there. Uh, so here, Craig and Chapel. Nobody forget to see the, 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 the sobs and the tears and the silence and the coffins coming up here one after the other. No 
tricolours over them, no, no guards on her, no, no guns or no firing volleys or nothing, just people sobbing, ordinary people, civilians. So, coming up on 50 years ago, this was packed with sobbing, families, heartache, tears, sniffle, stunned silence. I remember his family telling me that uh, they actually still would attend them. You had to get tickets for the family without so many members. And the dignity duties up the front from the Irish government and church leaders and that, visitors from over the world. More than anything, it was a community uh, and grief and mourning. The chapel's a lot changed now. It's a lot changed for the better, but back then there would have been a big marble. There was a marble surround around the altar. and. Uh, used to go up to get communion and kneel at the altar, so the coffins were behind it. Well, anyway, there was an idea that it would be usually symbolic if you were to bury the 13 victims on the, uh, they were killed on the day in a row. You know, uh, symbolic to the world and that, but Jackie Doty, his mommy, my aunt Maureen, had died in 1968, and uh, Bishop Dilly, Father Dilly then, had said that his last words were for his mommy. And so the family were saying, it's so only nice proper, they said, look, he's going to be buried on his mommy. So he was buried with his mommy. And all our families did the same, buried him with their loved ones and that. But there was five of uh, the victims buried in a row, which we'll go to. So maybe we'll have a wee look at Jackie's first and that. So here's the resting place of a uh, young boy, Jackie Dolly, killed on Sunday, 3rd of January 1972, aged 17 years of age. His dear daddy, boy, wee family grave, and his mommy. His mommy died age 44, that yeah, morning. Uh, I'm just looking there, look, she died uh, four days after the 5th of October, the original Civil Rights March. And there, young Jackie was killed in a Civil Rights March. So, for people from the Protestant Unionist community and things like that, or people in England and all about, I mean, you, as you see, there's no date for Ireland, Ogan and the Irons, uh, anything like that. It's just a, it was just a young, innocent boy. Here now then, we have uh, Kevin McElhoney, Michael Kelly, 17 years old, 17 years old, Hugh Gilmore, 17 years old, uh, Patrick Doherty and uh, Willie Nash. So that's the five, five, uh, the Bloody Sunday plot. And uh, as you can see, you have no flagpoles, no Oakland irons, no all this and that there, just honest people killed and uh, you do the Bloody Sunday Museum which I would highly recommend to anybody, it's a great tour and a great visit, 
John Kelly. Probably tell you about his brother. I'll tell you about his brother Michael. Now, but I tell you about the, the long-term effects it had on a lot of people. And Mrs. Kelly, uh, whenever she uh, wasn't feeling well, they knew to come in a bit finer here at Michael's grave, crying and sobbing uh, for him. So these are all neighbours of mine. And Ashes from Dunree and uh, Kelly's from down uh, Dunmore, etc., etc. Uh, so. I take tours on here for some people, education, we bring the young people over and the most, the most continuous bit of feedback we seem to always get is a while. A lot of people always say, what was it all for? You know, when they go around all the, all the graves and that thing and all. So anyway, these people are gone, but they're not forgotten. It's been 50 years and uh, still remembered and uh, it's going to be a sombre occasion and uh, so sad looking. I, as I was saying earlier, I left my child today, my grandchild at school today, and she's the same age now as I was on the 30th of January 1972, and I hope to God he never has to experience her witness in any of this year that we had. So, thank you very much. Goodbye. Jackie, I remember your face From a far distant place Yes, I do Jackie you were an innocent boy Why did they destroy Your future road to you You came from a home of nine sisters And five brothers Pop and the Cragen You were my cousin You worked with me brother Dustin and after me father Night and springtime, tending looms. Jackie, you were just 17 when they shattered your dreams, and we never got over it. Jackie.